Imagine a child surrounded by a loving family and attentive social services. Now picture that same child tragically passing away due to lack of food and violence. How could such a tragedy happen with so many protectors around? This is the heartbreaking story of Navin Jones, whose death shocked the Peoria community and the entire nation. Too many cooks spoil the broth, says popular wisdom. There were many caring people around Navin Jones, but the boy still perished. His passing shocked the Peoria community, as well as many citizens of Illinois and the United States. Yes, children pass away all the time, and we have to accept that. But this was a horrible tragedy. The boy suffered from malnutrition and violence. How could this happen with his father, mother, grandmother, and vigilant Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, officials nearby? There were too many guardians around him who did not trust each other. The DCFS deserves special attention. This organization is designed to protect and care for children. But what do statistics show us? In 2022, the year of Navin's passing, there were 171 child fatalities involving DCFS. This is stated in the report of the agency's Office of Inspector General. That same year, DCFS Director Mark D. Smith decided to leave his post. What was the main reason for his departure? What was he afraid of? Navin was found unconscious in his room by his mother in March 2022. He was 8 years old, but weighed only 30 pounds, just 13 kilograms. Navin's body was covered with cuts, bruises, and scars. Medical experts took graphic photos that were presented at the trial. It was not a sight for the faint of heart, but it was something the jury had to see. The Department of Children and Family Services needed to provide some explanation. While an intruder could have caused the scars and bruises, the child's weight was entirely the responsibility of DCF's investigators. The police had a lot of work to do. The police were shocked not only by the condition of the body, but also by the state of the boys' room. There was almost no furniture. Instead, feces were scattered around. The conclusion was clear. Navin was locked in the bedroom like a cage, forced to pass stool in the room. The DCS investigator needed to explain this as well. At the trial, she claimed she did not have the authority to remove the boy from his parents' house. Didn't she see the state Navin Jones was in a month before his passing? Prosecutors argued that if she had done her job, Navin might still be alive. The activities of the DCFS were increasingly exposed at the Navin Jones trial. There have been too many instances of criminal neglect of Illinois' most vulnerable residents. Earlier in October, a Lake County judge found one of two former DCF's employees guilty of ignoring warning signs of abuse in another deceased child, five-year-old A.J. Freund. Earlier in October, a Lake County judge found one of two former DCF's employees guilty of ignoring warning signs of damage in another child, five-year-old A.J. Freund. The disappointing conclusion was that the Department of Children and Family Services simply doesn't care about children. With such a track record, some concerned members of the public could conclude that these people are helping unfortunate children pass away. Ritual murders of minors occur from time to time. We cannot rule out the possibility of a destructive sect within the Department of Children and Family Services. This was suggested by the scars and bruises on Navin Jones' body. If this turned out to be true, a new scandal would overshadow the case of the neglected boy. The police only had to find such a cult or the person who committed this brutal murder within the DCFS. The truth, however, turned out to be more prosaic. Police found the sad picture of the DCFS. The organization's officials were overworked, with 20% of the vacancies remaining unfilled. At the trial, the DCFS investigator argued that she did not have the authority to remove the child from his parents a month before he died. She didn't deny that Navin Jones looked sick. At the very least, the DCFS investigator could have compiled a report on the boy's condition to get the attention of doctors and higher authorities. She didn't. In reality, the powers of DCFS investigators are limited. Often, they simply do not want to interfere in family affairs without an obvious reason. However, the history of this family is rich in events. Even before Navin was born into the Jones family, his brother Nagel died in 2007 under strange circumstances. This death was explained as sudden infant death syndrome. Stuff it, yes. Things like that happened, but this was already the second alarm bell. Before that, Navin's other brother, Bentley, was placed in foster care due to his parents' health. We don't know much about this boy, other than the fact that before Navin's death, 
His older brother was often by his side. Bentley did not stay in foster care for long. What were they talking about? Did they quarrel often? Soon after Navin was born, opiates were found in his blood. Someone had to have given the narcotic alkaloids of opium to the child. But for what purpose? Let's put this puzzle together. Bentley was placed into foster care due to his mother's poor health. Nigel died in his sleep. After this first mysterious death, police found drugs in Navin's blood. It seems that Stephanie was neurotic and also a drug addict. It's known that she was irritated by the child's screams. After Nagel's strange passing, relatives thought that the mother was out of her mind and might have done something wrong to the child. Laura Walker, Navin's grandmother, took an active part in Navin's fate. She decided that it was better to take the boy with her, especially after opiates were discovered in his blood. Laura Walker took pity on her daughter-in-law and did not talk about her suspicions. Instead, she told Child Protective Services about Stefani's excessive severity and only hinted at possible abuse. Soon, Laura took Bentley to her home, although he was not her grandson. Eight years of a serene life were given to Stefani's sons away from their mother. Alas, happiness does not last forever. Problems arose in Laura's family, and she was forced to give the children to Stephanie and Brandon, her son. When Laura's problems were over, the woman tried to bring the boys back. Stephanie flatly refused to return her sons. Now that they were grown up and no longer woke her up in her sleep, their mother loved her children again and no longer wanted to part with them. But Laura did not give up. She remembered Nigel's strange death, the opiates in Maven's blood and Bentley's placement in foster care. Brandon, Laura's son, supported his wife or simply did not want to quarrel with her. Either way, he didn't come to his mother's defense in this custody battle. The confrontation escalated in the summer of 2021, before the start of the school year. Laura wanted the children to go to school in Washington, Illinois and learn under her supervision. She had the legal status of a guardian and was going to get her way. But Stephanie had already acquired a taste for motherhood and did not give her sons to their grandmother. She ordered them not to leave the premises under any circumstances. Like Furies, two women fought for two boys. We don't know if Stephanie and Laura could have killed each other, but Officer Willis, who arrived at the scene of their brutal confrontation, was shocked. He was called by Laura to assert her legal rights. Officer Willis might well have thought that both women were equally dangerous for the boys. Each of them could have killed Navin, however Stephanie had a heavy hand. DCS investigators already had information about the son's abuse. In 2017, the services hotline received several messages. One such message, received around Christmas, was found to be valid. It concerned Stephanie Jones disciplining four-year-old Navin, resulting in bruises on his buttocks. This was the Christmas gift this kid received. That same year, his grandmother received legal guardianship. Can Laura's behavior be surprising? This woman may have known more than she told DCS investigators. If she had spoken up, this sweet angel might still be alive. Laura had family problems. She went to see her elderly mother who needed support. This woman was torn between caring for her mother and her grandson. We don't know why she didn't take the boys with her. Perhaps there were reasons for this. Laura Walker would probably have hired a caregiver for Navin and Bentley if she had the financial means to do so. But it turned out the way it did. While she was visiting her mother, the children were taken to their mother. There is something menacing and symbolic in this pull of motherhood. Laura was never able to bring Navin back in the future. Did he understand that his grandmother was his guardian angel? Laura Walker was a domineering and vindictive woman, at least according to Stephanie, who told Officer Willis this. Navin's mother was sure that Laura's rights to her grandson ended the moment she returned the boy to her. In her way, she was right, but legally, the grandmother still had rights. The policeman almost went crazy, listening to the simultaneous screams of both furious women. Deep down, he sympathized with Brandon, who had lived inside this confrontation for a long time. Laura behaved aggressively, trying to take her grandson away from his mother. Perhaps for this reason, the policeman did not take Navin away from his mother to hand him over to his grandmother. She scared him, and that is why he decided to leave the boy with his parents. Fearing for the children, Willis called Sergeant Lawrence for backup. While Willis restrained the women from mutual destruction, the sergeant went to check on the boys. Poor kids, he thought, forced to witness this terrible scene. Suddenly, Laura backed down. She decided to act legally. Following her complaint, Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, 
Staff repeatedly attempted to visit Brandon and Stefani to assess Navin and Bentley's condition. All their attempts were unsuccessful. Stephanie and Brandon did not confront the investigators, they simply avoided the meetings. Laura's desperation to get the boys back reached a tipping point over the ensuing days, and she sought police intervention yet again, filing a missing persons report for the children on August 24, 2021. For several months, DCF's investigators hunted for Brandon and Stephanie until they were able to make contact with Brandon in October 2021. He said they now lived in Florida and had no plans to return to Illinois. Navin's father even agreed to allow the social worker to visit the children at a scheduled doctor's appointment on October 21. Meanwhile, Child Protective Services, CPS, received confirmation from its colleagues in Florida that Stephanie and Brandon had no history of abuse in that state. This information was enough to deem Laura Walker's fears unfounded and to close Nevin's case on November 3, 2021. Without a clear idea of the boy's whereabouts and well-being, the detective leading the investigation even recommended that the children be excluded from the database. A new anonymous complaint in February 2022 prevented this from happening. After several unsuccessful attempts, DCFS investigator Kathy Harvey finally crossed the threshold into the home where the boys lived. Foremost, she interviewed the children, who said they were treated well, not beaten or scolded. Unfortunately, children often shield their parents, not fully understanding the gravity of their situation. However, Harvey noticed Navin's condition. He looked very thin and gaunt. The parents assured the social worker that the boy was eating well implying he must be sick and in need of medical attention. Then strange things began to happen in this case, which can only be explained by the slowness of the bureaucratic system and absurd fears. Navin's parents claimed they couldn't take him to the doctor because they didn't have legal custody. Laura Walker was the boy's legal guardian. Why wasn't Kathy Harvey concerned about this discrepancy? Didn't she see the child's deteriorating condition? But Harvey saw a standard house, a standard children's bedroom, and standard food that the boys ate. She chose not to notice that one of them was not quite standard. He was either malnourished or seriously ill. Harvey had to do something. Instead, she watched Navin eat popcorn and drink juice. At trial, DCFS investigator Kathy Harvey said she wasn't sure she had the authority to get him medical attention. She sincerely stated that she did not consider the boy's condition critical. I would never have thought that he would pass away. Instead, she insisted that Laura Walker give temporary custody of the boy to her son Brandon, citing Navin's medical needs. Laura Walker was not as domineering and vindictive as Stephanie described her. She agreed to give her son temporary custody of the boy. I was afraid for his health, she later admitted. I was afraid there was something critically wrong. The caseworker insisted this was the only way to get medical attention, and I signed it and sent it. Harvey received the guardianship paperwork from Laura Walker in the mail on March 29, 2022, the day Navin died. The state turned out to be unable to feel the pain of others. In the future, Harvey's actions will be assessed ambiguously in court and society. As usual, the management of the organization where the violator or criminal works refuses to comment or renounces the scandalized person. DCFS spokeswoman Heather Tarchin declined to answer questions from the Illinois Answers Project regarding Harvey's assessment and proper protocol. Charles Goldberg, Cook County Public Guardian, spoke politely but firmly about the incompetence of DCS staff. This erroneous belief reflects a huge failure of DCFS training or judgment or lack of adequate oversight or perhaps both, he wrote in an email. The Navin Jones case was a harrowing spectacle unfolding over the course of a week in Peoria County Court. Jury, made up of eight men and four women, took about 45 minutes to find Brandon Walker guilty of causing Navin's death in a manner described as severe and indicative of extreme cruelty. Despite the quick decision, Walker was determined to appeal, maintaining his innocence. In court, Walker mounted his defense with the help of a highly energetic lawyer who meticulously crafted a robust defense strategy. Walker denied any allegations of violence, asserting that he barely saw his children. He claimed that, as the father of one boy and the stepfather of another, he lacked the time and energy to deal with them. However, the jury might have questioned how he managed to find the time to visit hospitals with Bentley, his stepson. The prosecution could have delved into Walker's relationship with alcohol, 
although it's unclear if these issues were addressed during the trial. Speculation abounds regarding the true circumstances of Maven's death. Was it possible that Brandon killed his son in a drunken fit? Or could Naven's mother, Stephanie, have been responsible, possibly under the influence of narcotics? The case materials do not mention alcohol or drugs, leaving jurors and prosecutors to ponder if Child Protective Services, CPS, were aware of any parental addictions. This raises further questions about the effectiveness of the services charged with protecting these children, questions that remain unanswered and unexplored in the public domain. Walker testified that he last saw Navin two days before his death, after they had watched a movie together. He claimed Navin was healthy when he sent him to his bedroom on the second floor. The prosecution, led by Assistant State's Attorney Donna Cruz, strongly doubted this account, citing witness testimony that depicted a very different picture of Navin's health. The courtroom drama played out like a tragic dance on coffins, a bitter struggle between prosecution and defense. Cruz, a determined advocate naturally sided with Stephanie. She acknowledged Stephanie's neglect and severity, but refused to believe she was capable of intentionally killing her son. Meanwhile, Walker's lawyer, Gary Morris, maintained that Stephanie was to blame for Nevin's death, arguing that Walker, engrossed in his auto repair and towing business, could not provide the necessary medical care due to a lack of custody rights. Walker insisted he was in contact with DCFS, not Stephanie. The jury convicted Brandon Walker based on circumstantial evidence. Peoria County pathologist and an abuse pediatrician determined that Navin died from malnutrition. The defense's claim about the lack of legal custody was debunked. Walker had previously taken Bentley to emergency rooms and doctor's appointments despite not having custody. Pediatric nurses and doctors testified that they did not inquire about custody, further discrediting Walker's defense. Walker lied driven by a fear of prison, much like his previous fear of Stephanie. He was the one who received a note instructing him not to let Navin out of the house and to withhold food, a note found in the deceased child's bedroom. Donna Cruz argued convincingly that it was Brandon, not Stephanie, who was the primary culprit. And according to her, Brandon persuaded his wife to withhold food from their child, leading to his passing. When a child passes away, whether through neglect or mistake, Dirty laundry and recriminations are brought to trial by opposing groups of relatives. Brandon Walker's lawyer placed all the blame on Stephanie. Donna Cruz, Peoria County Assistant State's Attorney, tried to charge Brandon Walker. One cannot envy the fate of the jury, who were forced to listen to terrible, unpleasant things. But they get paid for it. The court made the fairest decision possible. It charged both parents with first-degree murder, with only Stephanie pleading guilty. Walker's defense attorney, in a short interview after the verdict was writ, said his client plans to appeal. There are too many people to blame in the Navin Jones case. His parents received life sentences, and rightly so. But many people around the boy saw his condition and could have helped. Employees of the Department of Children and Family Services, as well as police officers, doctors, and nurses involved in the case, claimed that they acted on instructions. Formally, they are right. We cannot bring charges against officials who act according to instructions. However, Navin Jones died because everyone around him was afraid to go beyond their authority. The boy was departuring in front of everyone. There were too many witnesses to his death. Navin Jones did not die in the desert. Two women fought for custody of him, and employees of the Department of Children and Family Services chose not to intervene. Too many cooks spoil the broth. These cooks did not spoil the broth. They killed a small, defenseless person. Something is wrong with law enforcement. There are no perfect laws or perfect people, but when fear for your career is stronger than compassion for your neighbor, this is the most frightening thing. Who killed Maven Jones? His mother, his father? These two just carried out some physical action. From a broader perspective, it is not so important which of the two parents is the true culprit of death. The child was killed by indifference, fear, and hatred. It was hatred that pushed Brandon to do that to the boy, who demanded attention and care. It was fear that whispered to Stephanie to leave Navin next to her at all costs. Women are often afraid of loneliness in old age. Anyone who saw but did nothing can be accused of indifference. The murder of little Maven Jones is a collective murder, with varying degrees of guilt for everyone involved. Children die from time to time, but we can make sure there are fewer of these deaths.
Sometimes you just need to extend your hand or say a kind word. We must stop being indifferent. Otherwise, society will fall apart.